করে দিন স্যার ওকে वेलकम एवरीबॉडी and uh, so this is the first live session uh, i'm sorry for <laughs> having this one a bit late but then uh, i'm going to address all the uh, all the questions which i have received and any further questions which uh, you feel like asking at this point of time we will uh, be doing that as well and uh, i hope that you have been enjoying the sessions on uh, deep learning for visual computing which we have uh, done till now and uh, also will continue enjoying them so there are a couple of questions which i have already received on the query form which was provided and uh, other questions are something which you can ask on the chat so i'm following or the youtube like chat as well so you can ask your questions there and i would try to answer it so the first question <coughs> which i have over here is how deep neural networks can be used uh, in real time applications in computer vision so uh, I mean, it's more of a very broad statement, and uh, most likely you might not have uh, started with the second week, uh, possibly when you might have put these questions, because uh, otherwise it uh, comes out as uh, very straightforward. Because that's where uh, I've been uh, discussing out the practical applications of them. But uh, nonetheless, keep something in mind that uh, for deep neural networks, these are essentially machine learning based uh, application methods, which do not restrict themselves to whether it's a natural language processing or it's computer vision or it's image processing or medical imaging any of those kind of problems so what we are trying to do is if there is a human being who would be solving a certain class of problem in which you have a set of inputs given and you desire to have a certain kind of an output then uh, any kind of machine learning algorithm and in this particular case it's uh deep learning what it's going to do is that it will learn a very efficient way of mathematically mapping all of these inputs to the particular kind of an output uh which you desire to have so for computer vision that can be object recognition that can be object tracking so a practical thing is um, something like you you might know about uh, this autonomous driving and now that uber already has uh, autonomous driving cars in certain stretches of uh, us you have waymo which is also trying to pilot its uh, autonomous driving cars in the streets of singapore and hong kong and uh, a lot of other places in europe as well so all of these things what they do is you have a bunch of camera you have a bunch of environment sensing uh, sensors some of them are called as lidars and lidars are essentially uh, light based ranging techniques which measure what is the distance to the nearest obstacle or object in front of you so what they do is that um given that you have a visual feed and understanding about the obstacles in a 360 degree view around your particular car on which you are traveling and uh, they take in all of these inputs and then use a neural network in order to synthesize the logic of how to have the drive function created which is essentially going to tell like how will you be really driving forward uh, given this particular condition this so this is one of these points around with uh, say uh, for autonomous driving um, there can be even simpler cases something like smiley detect then you have these uh, smartphones which have special apps on them which beautify your images when you are taking them so they are some sort of regression problems which it solves out and it's an image to image transfer problems which they are doing so the, there are numerous number of such examples which we can put down over here and in fact as you would be progressing through the lectures in the initial part you have a lot many more on theoretical foundations but as you keep on progressing through the lectures then you would be finding out that it's not just theoretical foundations but you also have a very deeper uh, exposure and understanding about uh, uh, how they get used in the real world scenario so we will be coming down to uh simple cases with practicals uh in terms of digit recognition which is when you have handwritten uh digits in the numbers of 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 and then how do you really uh use a neural network in order to detect them and and this like plain jane deep neural network for doing that and from there we will be going deeper and deeper into things including generative models where uh, given a sketch or a random number can you synthesize the whole image around with it so that's one part of it i hope that answers uh, the first question on how uh, deep neural networks can be used because i don't get to see exactly who is attending this one and who is not so that becomes a bit hard uh, next i have a question which says uh, how to prepare for deep learning and what is the 
and what is the most important things that are required in deep learning on the basis of industry okay so uh, see critically um, what comes down when you want to make a career uh, within industry on machine learning then the primary things which you should be really good at include mathematics so uh, foundational skills over on mathematics and uh, which typically includes uh, linear algebra which is matrix and operations or matrices then uh, uh, things which include uh, statistics and understanding of statistics then information theory so that you can really have a very deep uh, rooted control over all of those concepts these are three fundamental mathematical concepts which you would need now beyond that you need to really have a good skill in uh, coding and should be at a point when you can relate a bunch of equation or any particular equation written down in a mathematical form to its uh, computer implementable equivalent code now while you do all of this along with that something which is much more relevant and important at this stage is also your ability to understand what are the limitations and uh, uh, what are the capabilities of the hardware units which you are using for these kind of computation so when you are running these computations that has a very critical role and in fact uh, you need to understand the limitations as well so whether it can run on a laptop with just near 4 gb of ram or you would be needing to shift it over to a computer system with 64 gb of ram and that needs a bit of your uh, dabbling around with a kind of related subjects on uh, computer architecture and organization and that should be good enough uh, as of now if i say currently from a industry standard point of view python is predominantly the lifeline of what we do on the coding part of it and uh, from the library part a lot of uh, people tend to use tensorflow it goes into a lot of products but uh, eventually over the years pytorch is evolving something which is not just restricted only to the research community which we used to see in the last uh, half of a decade but now pytorch is more of something which is pushing itself towards uh, with the recent versions it's actually pushing itself towards a release ready form so you can actually have uh, some sort of a uh, benchmark thing created on pytorch and then you can have a release ready a model also created out of it and in fact i know about a bunch of startups and and in fact even established companies which have a full scale of product offerings which are based on pytorch so these are few if you are looking at uh, having these deployments on uh, embedded platforms then uh, you need to know about a couple of libraries uh, uh, like onnx and uh, cafe which are much more popular and not just that uh, it's its popular because of some other reasons but the primary point is that uh, cafe is still uh, fundamentally based on uh, c++ and that essentially helps you come closer to the machine level understanding and machine level programming so that's how it uh, gets used over there then i have a question which pertains to question number 6 in assignment number 7 um now the the crazy thing around it is that uh, i cannot really recall question number 6 in assignment number 7 so directly the reason being that um, on on the system on which you basically answer those questions and assignments there is a randomization which takes place and the point is that when we as teachers submit we submit a bunch of them so now amongst a bunch of questions it's really hard if you can just type out the question uh, for me then i can help you understand as to where your doubt was instead of just putting down that blank thing over there so we will wait for this if uh, uh, narayanam is there then uh, if you can just write it on the chat the exact uh, query you have on the question then it would be much more easier to respond to it then i have uh, another question which is on how to create repository on github also explain about deployment of ml or ml models now see creating a repository on github is not a rocket science okay and uh, honestly i don't think that's that's a question which needs to be discussed on to this platform it's it's pretty straightforward go on to github.com um, create your own account over there the first thing which you do after creating your own account is it opens up a dashboard and it asks you do you want to create a repository or a project over there so just go with the next next flow it it has a very systematic way of asking you a certain set of questions the first thing it will ask you is like give a name of that one next is <clears throat> do you want to have a readme file 
and the third question which it will ask you is what is the license under which you want to release all of this now uh, readme file is optional you can choose not to even have it but generally i suggest that have a readme file because when you land up on github that's the first page which opens up uh, for your repository where people can really look into what you have done so you can put your uh, written instructions over there on how to use your repository what the purpose for doing that um how you can have some beautiful uh, images and figures of the results which you have obtained um placed over there and then that works out good the next question uh, and the last question which it asks essentially is what is the license you are going to choose so and there are a bunch of licenses and this is for the purpose that uh, it's an open source thing and uh, anything you release over there needs to follow down with a certain kind of a license agreement that in general codes are released under an apache license uh, uh, sometimes we even go with a github uh, with with the creative commons license over there and then there are many more i mean there is a gnu portable license as well there is an mit license there are vsd licenses you, you can choose any of them and in fact you can craft your own license agreement as well. there, there is no harm in that so that's what you do over there and there is not much of profit sign just get created <laughs> it doesn't nobody is going to sue you for making any mistakes over there uh the next thing is uh, also explain about deployment of uh, ml and dl models now honestly i did not quite catch what you wanted to indicate by this question it's a very small phrase and uh, whether deployment meant like uh, some use cases where they are getting used as of today or uh, whether you wanted uh, me to specify and stress more on like how do you deploy on a hardware device or on a practical device all of these ml dl models So if you're, uh, if uh, Swati Subhash is attending the live session, and you can uh, just write down a bit of details about the deployment question which you have, then I would really be happy to answer that. So these are the only questions which I had on the forum, which I have with me, uh, and then we have pretty much answered most of them. So let's uh, uh, Let's throw it open to the house, and uh, you guys can actually write down your queries on the chat. i see a lot of people i mean about nine people attending the live chat but then uh, i don't have anybody asking any questions and until you ask any questions oh now i suddenly see all the questions come okay so the first question which i see is what are the major sub domains of computer vision which are currently in trend okay ha huh. sub domains in computer vision 
had to answer it. What do you mean by a subdomain? <coughs> so from the research point of view, it's it's more of uh, object recognition, uh, in painting, object beautification, image to image translation, image to text, text to image, image text alignment, uh, image to natural language extraction, which is like people are speaking in a video. You don't have the audio feed, but you do a lip reading kind of a thing with the vision method and do it. These are these are some parts of it, but but essentially, I mean, they are very interesting on the research side of it, but not necessarily something which goes into a product and makes a lot of money. Now, if you're looking into where is uh, a larger revenue uh, chunk of it is essentially towards uh, uh, autonomous systems within industry. Uh, autonomous driving is still the tip of the iceberg for that, honestly. And the base of the iceberg is more of uh, at automating uh, all processes within industry. And that may not necessarily always be with respect to uh, having uh, something like uh, only vision. So there, there are a lot of uh, things which get added on to it. And it's a multi-sensor integration which uh, is used over there in order to do that. So that's something which uh, the VC. Uh, there is a lot to do with uh, uh, image editing, video editing, uh, post-production, uh, cinematic productions which is you're making movie and uh, you add a lot of uh, special effects and everything. So this is one side of it. And then which is more of like consumers and people and, and uh, uh, things to do around with it. And then comes down the other part, which I'm much more closely related to, and that's about healthcare and medicine. So uh, anything to do with medical imaging and medical image analysis understanding over there. So these are currently like two of those major verticals. One is industrial automation. Another is, uh, medical and healthcare with images. These are two primary ones, which more or less have about uh, 75 to 80% of market share within the whole market of computer vision within industry. Uh, okay, so I guess your trendy thing has been answered with that. Uh, Swati Jadav, I did find your thing. So it was essentially like you wanted to see as a deployment on hardware. Okay, so when you uh, are asking about deployment on hardware, then uh, anyways, anything is deployed on hardware. The, the nominal thing which you do is you deploy on a x86 or a x64 machine from Intel, uh, which is essentially your laptop or desktop, wherever you are putting it, or, uh, and you are executing. Now the point is that possibly what you might have indicated over there was uh, some lightweight hardware. <coughs> Example is Raspberry Pi, and how do you do it? now? It's not that tough. Uh, typically, Raspberry Pi kind of stuff. They support PyTorch uh, and TensorFlow, but uh, they are much more uh, easy to program when you go with uh, closer to C++ models uh, and try to do something with Cafe. One of the ways which we, which most people do as of now, um, is uh, you essentially have something created on TensorFlow or PyTorch or uh, MXNet or VectorNet, any of those. And then you use the ONNX uh, pathway. So ONNX is an open neural network exchange platform. What it does is that uh, given some, your friend wrote a neural network and trained it and gave it to you with PyTorch. And you are much more conversant with TensorFlow. Then how do you really exchange all of these? Like how will a trained model from one particular language come down to the other particular language? And the way of doing that is using ONNX uh, to do it. So it's a platform agnostic way of writing it down, but when I say it's a platform agnostic way, it does not mean that tomorrow you create your own library, some XYZ net um, or XYZ flow, or I don't know what server. And then um, from that library, it can directly be converted. That doesn't happen so straightforward. You have to go through the whole ONNX community support in order to get down this cross conversion happening as well. So uh, once you do it to ONNX and then just get it reconverted onto uh, Cafe2 uh, and then Cafe2 executables and then you can deploy it on uh, Raspberry Pi. So uh, it's, it's not uh, that kind of a complicated matter. Uh, we also have very specific libraries which use the ONNX suite uh, to get it deployed on FPGA. So Xilinx has its own separate set of libraries in order to do it. But increasingly and more and more, what we have seen is uh, most people, at least on the inference side of it, would prefer to make use either of a basic ARM uh, CPU uh, if they are using an ARM uh, chassis, or if they are looking at having a complete new compute platform, then uh, in order to make uh, things simple and, and matters not so complicated, they just make use of an Intel uh, series of processor to get it done. And, and, that's like the easiest one to work around with without much of a complication. Over there. So 
so let me see around that how successful are specific hardware accelerators uh, this is on the chat from tushar how successful are specific hardware accelerators for real time deployment of neural networks now see one of the very standard specific hardware accelerator which you have is uh, a gpu so anything from uh, nvidia's uh, series on the gpus uh, they are hardware accelerators itself now when you say how successful then typically any of these gpus are very good for your uh, training task but they are not something which is recommended for inference task at all and the reason is very simple it's like the total amount of uh, the total number of watts which you consume or watts will be power i would rather go with energy so say number of joules of energy <coughs> which you can derive from watt hour uh, as such so the number of joules of energy you would consume in order to process an image would be much significantly higher when you try to do it with a gpu and uh, when you are going to do it with a cpu kind of an environment then it's much more easier to do it so that way to say uh, there is a trade off there is a balance and trade off which you will have to do so if you want things to be very fast and you are not looking at how much of energy you have consumed and that's not a major concern then people typically go with a gpu so say i want to do a collision detection system on a train i mean train is something which runs on megawatts of power you will not be worried about your kilowatt of load over there and uh, like just one kilowatt of load maximum and the other point is that you might want to have it really fast at 120 frames per second so in those kind of scenarios you don't worry but whereas you just want to have a um, say street lamp where you want to put a vision based system which can sense whether it's uh, sunlight or sunset and also maybe like during the night if it can track down if there is a car coming from or somebody walking from far away using infrared vision then only i will switch on the light otherwise not in those cases you might not want to use a gpu and on the other point is you don't want to put a very costly gpu on a lamp post that will be just get stolen in in any part of the world guaranteed so uh, there are these uh, specific things which you need to keep in mind now when you say successful i mean i really cannot answer that because you did not tell me whether you were asking me with respect to arm or fpgas or whatsoever as such every hardware is successful otherwise you wouldn't be able to code it down on your laptops for most of the assignments which i give it out then i have a question on the forum uh, which is how to get the same matrix whenever we run the program for publication huh. so i guess you are telling about a issue which happens with uh, random initializations of neural networks uh, and the other point being that uh, the train test and validate sets are not uniformly available so your friend might have used a certain train test and validate Uh, set combination and uh, got a certain metric, and when you try to repeat it out without knowing exactly which were his training samples, some other training samples, some other validation samples, and some other testing samples gets you a bit a bit change in results. I mean, sometimes that bit change in result is more than five percent, and sometimes it can be more than ten percent as well. So uh, yes, that's a problem. Essentially, uh, if you want to really come down to uh, Uh, generalized metric one thing which we do is we report folded cross validation that is a way by which we are able to minimize these kind of drifts instead of reporting for one single fold or one single run of the experiment we do it over multiple folds something like five fold cross validation is a very good well accepted me mechanism and in fact somewhere down the line uh, on the lectures there, there is a folded cross validation i don't recall the lecture exactly but i remember that i had uh, covered that uh, over there so you just need to go through that folded cross validation is the way forward um, even if you don't know about the folding of the data set still it can get rid of those biases over there then coming to the chat uh, there is uh, what can be exciting research topic to work on in medical image segmentation hmm i guess every single thing is exciting to work on it today if you tell me what is exciting i mean go get a bunch of covid x rays and try to segment out uh, ground loss opacities and consolidations in uh, x rays of covid patients that would be really exciting to work on there is there is nothing like <laughs> it's exciting today it's not exciting tomorrow i know that mammography was something which was uh, people were working on breast cancer detection in x ray mammograms in 1980s and 83 85 or something over there um, whole bunch of textbooks written uh, a lot of books which i have studied myself and then i'm still working on projects which do the same thing and what did we do over this 30 years i mean we have struggled to just increase our performance by 10% in 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 terms of accuracy 
but more than that 10% increase in accuracy something is like we have made computational models much more efficient now it requires less time to do it less amount of complexity to solve the same kind of a problem and um, on top of it another major thing which you uh, gain as an advantage is uh, we have been able to come down with something which we call as explainable explainability of uh, decisions which it takes which is how was it basically taking a certain decision now it can actually tell the radiologist how it was taken so there are tons of things one of the places which i can ask you to visit is uh, called as grand challenges in biomedical image analysis just uh, google up and search up for this particular website and go and watch out what of things which are happening within grand challenges in biomedical image analysis there are tons of it so if you are a newbie who is just getting started on this one this is a place i would very standard recommend you and very strongly recommend you to actually visit so uh, more than a decade worth of challenges i remember the last the, the earliest challenge is something from 2004 or 3 so if it is 2004 and do there is 2020 so 16 years of challenges with medical image analysis are present over there just start from one by one and then you will have numerous such things this is a much richer source than what kaggle can offer you then i have another question which is what are the trending areas to carry out research in biomedical image processing so i mean it's also a related question uh, get into that that particular challenge website uh, grand challenges in biomedical image analysis that's what is the current state of art so whatever is a challenge today you would find out challenges posted in 2020 for nikai and and also some uh, challenges which are agnostic to the conference dates and not posted by conference just just go through them i mean they are the ones which you would really want to look at it now so that's what i have i don't see any further questions either on the forum or on the chat though uh, i did not get uh, the question clear from narayanam ragunath uh, uh, narayanam uh, ranganath if you are there if you can just uh, type in that uh, question number 6 in assignment 7 then i would try to clarify that one as well
Okay, so now I got another interesting question. There are so many articles on COVID detection, segmentation, and classification. Can there be any other domain of possible research in that area, which can be a possible way way forward? Okay, I mean, <clears throat> you want to do anything on COVID, you don't need to restrict yourself to only segmentation and classification. One of the primary reasons is. Uh, what you are going to do is essentially assist a radiologist in the earlier part of it and and want to do something more than that you go and discover a vaccine there is nothing to do with medical image analysis as such if if you are uh, but then i was like uh, if you can clarify a bit i mean when you say that any other domain of possible research are you say like is it something like you are of an opinion that covid has basically shifted everything and other than covid there is no other research area and you want me to answer on that or uh, is it something like uh, you have a question which says that uh, beyond these kind of segmentation and anything which you do with images what other things can you do on image analysis with covid that's a clarity i would need uh, from sarosh if you can just uh, write that on the chat that would be nice Okay, I have another question on the forum, which is, uh, what is the scope of generative adversarial network algorithm? Generate crowds in movies, a very simple thing. Then uh, say uh, make uh, imposter videos. So uh, you did not say something, and your friend uh, wanted to uh, basically uh, some sort of like. make it an embarrassing situation for you so uh, he or she can make use of a generative adversarial network take your video and the voice over it and then such that now your lip movements will also be mimicking the lip movements of doing that one so now it becomes really hard in order to find that so uh, <coughs> well these are trivial things which you can do over there one of the ways how generative adversarial networks really rose up to popularity was uh, because in movies you need to synthesize out crowd and every single person in the crowd needs to have a distinct face so before gans uh, all of this used to essentially be uh, computer graphics and computer generated imagery but then uh, with the uh, onboarding of gans something which changed over here significantly was that uh, we are able to put down random numbers and facial expressions will change facial images would change all of these would change so you can you can synthesize really large number of things this is one part of it uh there are some serious things which have also happened which is uh, art restorations and uh, digital heritage has really gained a lot from uh, generative model one of the reasons is that you have art restoration which is going on and now that if there is a uh, you are not able to find a missing piece of the art which you wanted to restore but then it's basically linked as a story so you can have that as a series modeling created in in some sort of a hyper dimensional embedding space of the features and then from there you can use a genetic model in order to really synthesize these images and they can be used in order to carve out on stones and then you fix a missing tile or or something of that sort then uh, we use generative adversarial networks a lot uh, within uh, medical image analysis and um, uh, this is for the purpose that of something which we call as image restoration and though it's not like you put a random number and you get a ct image created out of it it's not that trivial but uh, image restoration when we look into it uh, one of the primary things is uh, that during ct or mr you can have a lot of reconstruction artifacts and we would like to get rid of those reconstruction artifacts so trying to get it as close as possible to the ideal anatomical uh, appearance model makes it much more easier so these are some of these very practical use cases of it um, there are uh, trivial use cases like those uh, apps which you have on facebook or on any of uh, instagram which is uh, it it like you click your own uh, selfie and then it uh, stylizes it as if uh, say van gogh had painted you so all of this uh, or or picasso had painted your painting in, in one of his uh, classic forms in which he paints so these are some of the fun examples around to do with uh, generative adversarial networks as well uh, money as such uh, or or what industry runs on revenue Uh, is within the computer generated imagery uh, media uh, movie productions is where gans really get used into it and uh, don't try to put down those voice over to others because that's a legally debated thing and 
you can pretty much get impersonated for ip and then uh, violation of uh, right to privacy of a person as well but there are papers you can look into which show it there are open source repositories on github which have put it down because the best way of avoiding any sort of a complication around it is you just put it on the open source and, and then if the source is open then anybody can use it so that way it's it's even imperative for the legal uh, guardians to know that things are very straightforward app level now if somebody is making a criminal use out of it then it is only up to that person uh, who is responsible of making use of it not not the inventor in any way yeah so that's for guys and uh, yeah though the question from sarosh i did not uh, get a clarification and i'm still waiting for him whether this is related to any other domain of algorithm or whether by domain he was indicating i don't know he or she so whether by domain you are essentially indicating uh, other than covid something else on which you can work on So now I have it. Yes, sir. My research area is medical image security and analysis, but I wanted to integrate that with the COVID detection using X-ray and CT. Okay, this. So if you want to integrate image security with COVID detection, and one of the things which brings to my mind immediately is uh, why not work on uh, federated learning or. Uh, Uh, split machine learning kind of applications under uh, secure environments, which is you want to share uh, the information derived out of images, but you don't want to really share the direct image itself. Then how do you do it? So just look into differential privacy and federated learning. You might get some great ideas around with it. And uh, with COVID being one such situation where the total number of samples is less, and uh, there are concerns around uh, cross nationality sharing of the data which is one country's data cannot be shared with another country so under these kind of uh, restrictions and impositions how do you really get to make use of it so uh, one way is to look into federated learning and i strongly believe with your background in image uh, security and medical image security in specific you shall be able to contribute really good with that actually there is a good challenge i think they might have stopped uh, taking in any further acceptances as of now but you can look through their website it's the covid-19 eu challenge and uh, they have some uh, great challenges around with federated learning and uh, secure machine learning over that whereby the data stays within the hospital and the country itself it's not shared but you can uh, run your codes on their machines over there and still derive the knowledge from that okay so this is from ishan gan has also contributed to big fix do you think the current level of media forensics is enough to detect yeah this is what i can very very straight forward and very strongly say the current level of media analytics and media forensics is really good to detect deep fakes in fact it's not that complicated i can i can give you a very simple example you take a deep fake you take the original image go into the fourier domain or get a dct done and look into the coefficients over there and that's a very straight forward way of uh, identifying a deep fake from the other because whatever you are doing on a deep fake is processing on the spatial domain that does not touch up on the fourier signatures or the frequency signatures which are also very critical dual property representations of ideal images and that's the reason uh, and, and the reason behind that is because your frequency signature is very specific to the camera optics and the sensor geometry which is placed over there so there will be indications within that which you will never be finding in deep fakes and in fact it's a very straightforward way of it. there is actually a darpa paper on spotting deep fakes which was uh, commissioned by the darpa's explainable ai committee um, from multiple research groups you can look into that it's it's freely available on the darpa website and then you will get ideas on how uh, how easy it is actually to spot deep fakes
So let's see, do we have any further questions either on the forum or on the chat? You can end the session if you want. Okay, I think uh, since there are no questions. Yes, now I see Ranganath Narayanam coming down. Question number six in assignment seven. So Ranganath, can you just quickly type in the question? I've been waiting to get to you since the start of this session, but uh, you haven't come down. I just need you to type in the question over there quickly so that I can answer it. Calculate the number of trainable parameters for the convolutional neural network. So I'm gonna, this is there in the lectures. You might have possibly not yet gone through that specific lecture or possibly skipped it out very fast. I remember that there is a very specific lecture on which you have uh, the number of trainable parameters, uh, of example given now. And not just trainable parameters, but also the total number of uh, bytes it would be taking in order to store the model. Please go through that lecture. Then there is a complete uh, clarity given. And in fact, I have derived it out uh, for uh, standard fully connected networks on a layer by layer basis. Yes, Raghunath, I understand that this is a question on the assignment sheet. What I'm suggesting is that the answer and the complete derivation to this is there in the lectures. you need to appropriately go through the lectures. But half explained. So Ranganath, what I would suggest you is that whichever section you are not able to understand on that question, you can actually put it down on the forum. We will have one of our TAs provide you a complete detailed solution and explanation on that one. Because we have already run out of time. I was actually waiting on this particular question since the start of it, but uh, you came down just at the last minute to ask it and uh, we have to close it because I, as I know that there is another impending session, uh, live session just after this one. Yes, I think uh, we can end the session for now.
टाइम अप सर ओके वी एंड इट thank you all then we end the session and we will again get back on the uh, next session as it gets planned